Originally, I uh, was raised in Reno, Nevada. <clears throat> I joined uh, the Army uh, Air Corps in uh, September of uh, 1940, not long out of high school. Jobs were tough to get, not enough money to go to college, so I thought I'd uh, join the uh, Air Corps and start out as a mechanic, required two years of college. I wanted to fly and required two years of college. So uh, <clears throat> I was sent to Hamilton Field, 21st Pursuit Squadron, and uh, I just returned from uh, six months of schooling down in uh, uh, Glendale, California at Curtis Wright Technical Institute for Aircraft Engine Mechanic School. And uh, when I just got back, this buddy of mine and I, the first sergeant told us where they were leaving. And uh, well, yeah, he said, you can either get out or, or uh, go with us. Uh, and we said, where are you going? He said, well, it was figured it was somewhere down around South America. So we said, well, that sounded pretty good. And he said, well, get up to the hospital and get your shots right away. And the next thing I know, we were uh, on the President Coolidge sailing under sealed orders, and uh, we ended up in Manila, uh, the Philippines. <coughs> and uh, this was very close to Thanksgiving time, November 21 or 23, I think, when we arrived there in Manila. What year? Uh, pardon? What year was that? 1941. And uh, just only had a couple more weeks, and uh, Pearl Harbor ensued, and war started. And we were uh, at Nichols Field, just outside of Manila. And the Japanese came in and strafed and bombed us, and uh, that was our introduction to uh, baptism of fire, more or less. And, uh, and then we were transferred out to a place called Lubao, the Lubao Field, and uh, we had about 25 P-40s at that time and uh, kept them in a sugar cane patch and uh, spread barbed wire over them, put sandbags around them and uh, chicken wire, I mean, over the tops, and bamboo posts in the four corners and uh, put sugar cane down through the cut notches in the sugar cane, and pulled it down through the covering and made it look like we were in a sugar from the air, it looked just like a sugar cane patch. In fact, uh, one of our anti-aircraft units shot down a, a Japanese bomber, and it landed right, right close to the place I was, right on the field there, and uh, the Japanese didn't even realize that there was an airfield there. When the uh, war began, uh, one of the first attacks the Japanese made, they hit... Uh, Clark Field destroyed, uh, I forget how many B-17s, but it was a major part of the B-17s in the United States Air Force at that time. And they were trying to beef up the Philippines then to, uh, for uh, war if it came. And of course, uh, they didn't get enough equipment or enough people over there. And war broke out and then the, uh, uh, we, we moved then from Lubao when it was the Japanese started advancing down from Lingayen. And uh, so we moved down to uh, Bataan, which is a peninsula on the island of Luzon, the northernmost of the Philippine archipelago. And uh, <coughs> uh, we were, by that time, without planes, the, the original all the B-17s were wiped out in the first attack, and the uh, P-40s were used up pretty fast after that. We tried to maintain some of them flying by uh, cannibalizing the old ones and taking parts from here and there, and even using, uh, uh, attaching bombs to the, the fight, these fighters, and they went into some uh, attacks on some of the shipping that was coming in. Well, eventually, we, we, uh, when we moved down on a Bataan, we started eating two meals of rice a day. And uh, ammunition was scarce, food was scarce, uh, medical supplies were scarce, and uh, 
We held out for four months and uh, our, our group was used as infantry soldiers and uh, we were called in at uh, what they call the Battle of the Points at Agaloma Bay. And they, when we first went in there, they said, well, there's, there's about 50 Japs landing on the beach. And uh, we got in there and about two weeks later found out there's about 500 of them dead we killed. And uh, only eating two meals of rice a day. And uh, it was highly infested, this area was highly infested with malaria. Uh, mosquitoes were real thick. So pretty soon everyone started coming down with malaria, dengue fever, I got dengue fever. Uh, and uh, then they got dysentery from the malnutrition and uh, disease started spreading pretty fast. And the uh, Japanese uh, started mounting more and more offensive and finally they backed off and, uh, and got everything together and they put in about 250,000 troops the Americans at, uh, on Bataan, there was about uh, 12 to 15,000, and the rest of the Philippines, I think there was about another 10,000. So there was about a total of uh, 20 to 25,000 Americans, and there was about 60 to 70,000 Filipinos, and there were about 50 to 60,000 civilians that all moved down onto this little peninsula. And uh, so by... Uh, Finally, on April the 9th of 1942, the uh, General King decided that he couldn't uh, stand it any longer. He was out of ammunition, we were out of supplies, out of food. Uh, all his troops were sick. Half of them couldn't even navigate. There were a lot of people hospitalized. Uh, uh, those that were in the field were uh, unable to really continue. So he decided to surrender. Uh, Bataan. And then Corregidor, which is a, uh, an island uh, in the bay of uh, Manila Bay, uh, protected the harbor of uh, Manila. And the Japanese were after that. And of course, it was still held out for another month. But as soon as the uh, Japanese took it over, why they uh, took over Bataan, they started moving their artillery and everything down, started shelling Craigador, and they already had uh, complete air superiority, and they were bombing it continually. And uh, they took an awful beating there on Craigador. And that, that's what, uh, when the uh, surrender came, uh, I was uh, down at uh, Marvelis, which is on the southern tip of the Banan. Batan Peninsula, and uh, Japanese came in and uh, took everything that you had. I mean, if you had a watch or a uh, ring or uh, money, anything they wanted, they just took. If you didn't like it, well, they'd, they'd shoot you right there, or cut your head off, whatever they felt like doing, and they were pretty brutal. And that started to march, so they mar started marching us up the uh, peninsula on the uh, east side going north and uh, <clears throat> we're in the boiling sun and the dirt road the dust was maybe six inches thick and it just boiled up everywhere and the, the heat was real oppressive and the mosquitoes and uh, it was just generally it was a, a real terrible situation and they were moving all their equipment troops and artillery and everything uh, against the flow of traffic the way we were traveling. So half the time they pull us off to the side and let some of their equipment go by and get us back on the road and start in again. Uh, sometimes they'd have us running, sometimes stop, sometimes just walking. And uh, first thing he did, uh, started banging everybody that still wearing helmets. So he had these little helmets for like Pro or one helmet. and. Uh, Everybody started discarding them pretty fast because they'd knock them off of you. And uh, then uh, everybody started getting pretty thirsty and there were a lot of artesian wells along the road. And uh, the minute you'd go for water, you were lucky if you could get to it, you might get shot, you might get bayoneted, you might get beaten real bad. And uh, so you soon learned to 
to uh, stay in line and uh, and not jump out, try to get yourself some water. I I got some water out of an old uh, wallow that was kind of mud, muddy water, and I had a a little uh, little bottle of diodine, and I had a, a matchstick, and I'd I'd take and put the matchstick in the iodine, and and then put it in my canteen, take this water, and then I shook it up and left it for a half hour before I drink any of it. And that kind of helped, I guess. <laughs> uh, really, the uh, little group I was with, we thought that uh, when a surrender came, we thought we were just moving back to, uh, to go up into the hills and continue until, you know, uh, fight, fight a final battle. Yeah, but that's the way it turned out. Yeah, everybody despaired to see the flag come down and the, and the white flags go up and all this sort of thing. And it just uh, made you about half sick just thinking of that. And then they started moving people out of the hospitals. I saw uh, some. I saw a couple of Filipinos with no legs going along the road, trying to make their way. And I mean, they were, they weren't given any further consideration. They were just another, just other troops as far as the Japanese thought. And uh, uh, they come along with uh, their trucks and and reach out with clubs or or their, uh, their guns and uh, whack people, uh, you know, as they come alongside. And uh, they thought it was great fun. Uh, they had a pretty perverted sense of humor. And uh, there were a lot of people killed on the, on the march. Uh, the march itself, uh, for me, lasted about nine to, nine to 10 days. I'm not quite sure. It was like a big nightmare. Uh, we ended up in a town of San Fernando and they put us in what we call a pig pen there. It was, uh, men were sick and there was feces all over and it was just one real mess. Most, most of the men had thrown away most of their equipment because it got so heavy they couldn't carry it any longer. And you were lucky if you could just keep your mess kit in a canteen and a uh, hat if you had one and a, a little jacket or something to keep you covered from burning in the sun. Uh, some up, some people didn't even have that much. And uh, there were, I, I think there was uh, close to a thousand Americans lost their lives on that march. They were shot, bayoneted, uh, fell out and couldn't continue. It was around 65 to 75 miles the total distance. I, I don't know, it's just a, a natural uh, will to survive, I think. Some, some men, uh, like you say, were so depressed that they just gave up and they, they didn't want to continue any longer and they, they didn't, uh, there was no food. I mean, on the whole uh, nine days, I got one little ball of rice. That was, what, that was the total amount of food I got and a little bit of rotten water. And uh, I tried to stay in the middle of the group, which was one thing that I think helped. You know, you're in a big crowd, and of course I'm small, it helps. And the Japs like to pick on a, a bigger American, kind of gave them a sense of uh, feeling better about themselves, I guess. But uh, uh, they didn't uh, beat up on me. I remember just as I was pulling into San Fernando, one of the fellows in our outfit was a little ways ahead of me, and, and they, uh, he just had just, you know, maybe a block to go. And a, a guard was trying to hustle everybody along. So he just come up and he drove a, a bayonet right into his butt. And that just, you know, a uh, poor guy had gone through all that uh, uh, long uh, march. And then he ended up getting that. And then uh, we were there in San Fernando a few days. And, and then they put us on these uh, steel uh, boxcars crowded us in, oh, as many as they could get. The cars weren't very big, kind of a little narrow gauge railway. But they crowded us in like a uh, hundred or better to a car so that you could hardly move. And anybody that got sick or died just stayed standing up. There was, and we were about three to four hours on the hopping along, jerking and stopping and starting and so on on this train. They closed the doors so you could hardly breathe. And uh, anyway, after we got 
through that, why uh, they unloaded us at a place called Capus. And uh, we had about a five mile hike then up to uh, Camp O'Donnell, which was the first and probably the worst Japanese prison camp. Uh, there were, I think in the first couple months in that camp, there were, must have been uh, five to 6,000 Americans died in there. They, were, they didn't allow us to have hardly any food. There was no medication. Uh, people were dying like flies, uh, dysentery. It was just, they had a, a zero word where they put men that were uh, no chance to survive. And the uh, Filipinos were dying at an even greater rate. There were a lot more of them, and uh, they were, uh, I think they were a little less sanitary. They tried to, you know, didn't maintain a sta sanitary uh, degree that we did. And I think there was close to 20 to 25,000 Filipinos died there. And this was just in the first few months. And then uh, I went out on a work detail. Uh, I wanted to get out of there as fast as I could. And I, I came down with dysentery and uh, I ate a friend of mine uh, started a little fire and burned a bunch of wood and then I'd eat the charcoal to uh, help me and that uh, uh, kept me enough in shape that I could get on a truck and get out of there with a, a group of 150 guys that were leaving. They were sending details out all over uh, the area to uh, pick up a lot of the equipment that we'd left and uh, rebuild bridges and uh, a lot of the bridges that uh, we had blown. And, uh, and uh, the detail I got on was, went to a place called Lumban. There was 150 of us, and we were supposed to rebuild a, a bridge across the river there. And uh, they hauled, uh, uh, some of the guys were sent up into the hills uh, to get the timbers and bring them down. And then we, uh, I, had to, I worked with an ads and uh, stood on logs and, and trimmed the edges with uh, but luckily, I didn't cut a foot off, and uh, uh, we we worked there for quite a while rebuilding a the bridge. They had a little pile driver out of there. Most of it was just brutal uh, manual labor, you know, slave labor, really. And uh, we had one guy there that was uh, the bull, and he had a a whip. We call it, you know, a bull whip, and uh, he'd uh, he liked to, uh, you know make people jump with that. <coughs> and uh, anyway, we, we lived in a, a little, uh, uh, Philip, this is a little Filipino uh, barrio, and we lived in uh, uh, what had been a little theater. It was more like a big old barn, and uh, had a dirt floor, and had a bunch of benches in there that the people sat, and there was a stage and so forth, and we put all the, the uh, dying up on the stage, and uh, we slept uh, two or three to a, to one of these benches. That was our bed, and uh, the only thing you thought about at the at the at the moment was food and uh, survival. And the only thing you could think of, you were always hungry. You always wanted something to eat, whatever you could get to eat. Well, that was that was the main uh, thing that you thought about, and. Uh, then one one uh, night, why the the uh, Filipino guerrillas attacked, and uh, they killed a couple of the guards, chopped one of their heads off, and uh, one man left with them. They they wanted some people to leave, and uh, nobody was too anxious really to leave because everyone was so sick, and they didn't real know the uh, area. They didn't know if they'd be able to survive in the hills with the, uh, the disease and everything. And uh, they had no mosquito nets, and you really need a mosquito net. They had no uh, understanding of, of uh, what the situation was outside the camp. And uh, so uh, when this, this one fellow left, we thought they'd be real happy about it. And uh, the next uh, day, why they, uh, took all of us and marched us up to the schoolhouse at their headquarters, which was a few blocks away. And then they wanted to query 
they had officials there from Manila and they wanted to query the anyone that had seen this fellow leave. And eventually they got 10 people out among us and uh, stood out in front of the group. They said, okay, now we're gonna, we're gonna shoot all these 10 for the one that left. And uh, so they, uh, nearby there was a coconut grove, big open area in it. And they put them, lined them up there. And then they, they had a machine gun set up at each end here and they marched us in behind the firing squad and made us watch it. One, bro one guy saw his own brother get it. And uh, so they, they shot him and they didn't even do a good job of that. They, they, they didn't even knock them all down the first round and it took two or three or four rounds and finally the guy went up there with a uh, pistol and finished them off. But it was pretty horrible and, and uh, even some of their, their own people were, really felt that. And that uh, began the uh, edict in, the, in their camps that you, you were in a, what they call a blood brother group. Uh, you were assigned to a group of 10. And if one of those guys left, the, other group, uh, the rest of the group would get shot. And uh, so that was to uh, kind of stop people from trying to escape. Well, they took us, uh, after this incident, they didn't make us work much more. That kind of ended the uh, work on that bridge and we had, a, it was fairly complete at the time. So they took us all back in trucks into uh, where they'd moved everyone else. They'd moved uh, all the ones that were in uh, Camp O'Donnell over to this new camp, uh, Cabana Tawan. And uh, they'd also moved the, uh, the prisoners from uh, that had t been taken on Corregidor, and uh, they were also in Cabana Tawan. So I was in there for a while and uh, worked on various details, and one of them was uh, the burial detail, and uh, they used to just uh, strip the men of everything they had because whatever clothing they had that could be used by somebody else, and uh, put a dog tag on. If they had a dog tag, they'd leave that on, or if they didn't have a chain, they put it in his mouth. Or if they didn't have anything, well, they'd just take a piece of paper and write his name on it, put it in his mouth. And then we'd put them on a, uh, a window uh, shade uh, that they use over there and uh, lift them up on some poles and take them out. And there, when I, I was there about three, four months, I left there in October and uh, all that time, they were, they were dying at the rate of, when I left, they were still dying at the rate of 50 a day. And uh, this, of course, was just from uh, poor treatment by the Japanese. It was, they didn't give enough, there was hardly any medicine, there, people were sick, uh, dying of starvation, there wasn't enough food. And uh, so that was a cause of, of people dying. There was really no necessity. They had plenty of everything. They could have could have kept everybody alive. This execution of these 10 men naturally left a, a deep impression. Uh, uh, bur uh, the, uh, burying these men, throwing them all in, uh, you know, maybe 50 or 60 into a hole, one common hole, and uh, just putting a little dirt over them. And uh, you'd go up there the next time and the rain uh, had, you know, there's a lot of heavy rain over there, and uh, be raining, and the uh, arm or legs sticking out of the graves and stuff, uh, and you're throwing them into another whole bunch here. Yeah, so that was that, that was a, a depression. Uh, <coughs> one time, uh, they had a bunch of recruit Japanese recruits in there training them, and uh, they took off, and went up to uh, a nearby. Uh, uh, town or whatever up in the hills nearby uh, chasing uh, uh, gorillas, uh, Filipino gorillas. And they came back uh, late in the afternoon and they were all singing and marching up the road. At the head of the column they had a head. They'd cut the head off of one of these guys they'd caught up there. And they had it on a long pole and here they were marching along singing holding that pole up on, or head up on the pole. Uh, the uh, that's another 
impression. Another one was the uh, latrines uh, were uh, nothing but holes uh, dug out, you know, and and uh, and they uh, would get so filled with feces and everything, and the and the maggots would uh, be crawling. There'd be millions and millions of maggots running on those things, and the food, the uh, because of all that situation, the, the flies were thicker and swarm like swarm of bees and uh, blowflies, and uh, they had what we call lugao. That was our rice that we got, and it was a, like a real mush, our uh, uh, wet, mo uh, real uh, watery, and it had uh, some kind of goo in it, and you had to sit there, and the blowflies would come down on, on this, you know, and you had to just fan like that and try to dig in with your spoon to get a little before the flies and keep try to keep the flies off. That's another impression. Uh, and then uh, from there, we, uh, I, uh, there was a, they asked for another group to go out on a detail. This was a thousand men. And uh, so I volunteered to get on that and got out of there. And they uh, loaded us on a train, took us from Cabana Tuan down to Manila marched us through the streets of Manila and there got another impression. There was some of the, we looked like a bunch of uh, uh, scarecrows, I guess, and uh, real disheveled and uh, a lot of people with beards and uh, real sick and uh, lost a lot of weight and everything. And they marched us right through Manila. Well, anyway, uh, they uh, took us down to the dock and loaded us on a freighter. And they took us, uh, south uh, uh, on a trip took about 10 days and down in the hold of this uh, freighter which was our quarters they had been carrying horses and there was a lot of horse manure and stuff and there were bunks uh, double decker I guess they'd be carrying their own troops that way I don't know <laughs> but uh, it, it was a smelly stinking mess but they allowed us on deck and we so we were on the rear uh, fantail part of the ship but we got up there and stayed up there most of the time and uh, we were about 10 days and they took us down south to the island of Mindanao on the southern end of that and unloaded us and we had to march about 15 miles then and we ended up in a Davao penal colony and uh, it was a uh, had health uh, Filipino convicts and they put us in there and took all the Filipinos out, except the Filipinos who ran the, were more or less supervisors for the work that was done there. And uh, the, uh, the main thing there was the uh, working in the rice fields. There were huge rice fields. And this, is, uh, this had been a uh, government experimental station for agriculture. And they were trying all kinds of things there. And, uh, uh, they'd just gone in there and hewn out of the jungle thousands of acres and we had a little uh, a little diesel train and they loaded us up. We got up at the crack of dawn and they loaded us up on that little train. Flat cars like little mine cars. Get about maybe 20, 15, 20 guys sitting on that. Each one of those little cars, maybe 10, 15, 20 of those little cars and this little diesel pulling us. Then we go out through this jungle area and all of a sudden it'd open up in the big rice fields. And there'd be harrying over here and they'd be planting here and harvesting over here. And it was just, and the weather was such that, that uh, it would rain and then it would dry out. It would rain and dry out and all in the same day. And it would get hot and then it'd start raining. And, and so everything just grew like mad. It was really uh, prolific there, the way stuff would grow. But of course, they, they were shipping this rice out to their troops and stuff and, and, and eating it themselves there in the camp. But what we got was out of the, uh, the floor sweepings out of the bodega where they stored everything. And it was uh, contained uh, uh, little white worms and uh, uh, rat leavings and uh, little brown bugs and uh, 
So, but anyway, we, it was all well boiled, and uh, we, that's what we ate. We got more rice to eat there. We ate three meals a day of rice, and I got a little bit of, you'd get a, uh, it had a, one of these uh, sardine cans with a handle on it, and that was, and they'd reach in this bucket of rice and scrape, scrape it level, and that was your share. And uh, then he'd give you a little dab of salt, a little dab of real uh, coarse salt. And uh, then they, they threw a, a sock full of tea into a 50-gallon drum. And you, so you got what supposedly was tea. It was actually colored water. And uh, so that's what we had most, of the, most all the time for food. There was a group from the... When we got there, there was a thousand of us that came, and then there was the thousand that was already there for, that were on the southern end of the Philippines that had been uh, taken there. And uh, so they were already in the camp when we got there. And uh, so I worked there uh, for, oh, golly, till uh, March of 44. And in March of 44, they took, uh, 700 and, uh, 650 of us and uh, sent us on a work detail out of there and that was not too many miles away more or less toward the coast and we uh, were used the slave labor again to, to build a, an airfield and we uh, the tasks there varied we you might work down in the coral pits where they were blasting coral out and they'd, I'd uh, dig holes in the coral bank and then put charges in there and blow it, and then and then we'd uh, take and break it up with uh, sledgehammers, load it up on trucks, and uh, then they take it up on the airfield and lay it out. And they kept big, heavy stuff first, and they kept building it up. And they must have built it up oh, three, four feet for the whole length of the runway. And it finally ended up with powder on the top. And uh, they had a little old steamroller there and so forth. And uh, then we had to level the land and so forth, first of all, to get the, the runway and to get the, the, the revetments for the planes out in the sticks there. And then dig big ditches along the sides to drain off the heavy rains and so And uh, so we were there for till uh, August. There were some people. Well, we had what we call latrinograms because when, <laughs> when you went to latrine, some guy tell you a uh, story, and you didn't know whether to believe it or not. And there was all kinds of false stories. And then there were some. Uh, actually, I didn't know that there were there was a hidden radio in the camp, and they were getting some real information. And uh, some of the guys learned actually to read Japanese, and they got some of the Jap papers and read some of the stuff there. But the really uh, convincing thing uh, was that uh, after we'd been at this airfield and working for quite a long while, uh, some planes come over one night. You could definitely tell, you know, the, the, the sound and uh, dropped some flares and took some pictures. Then we knew that they were getting close. The only trouble was that the the Japanese also came in, right? This happened in the middle of the night, and the Japanese came in and, uh, and uh, set up machine guns at each end of the barracks. You know, we had about four barracks, and uh, uh, they'd set up a machine gun. You figure, well, you know, they're just going to cut loose on everybody, and what are you going to do? Are you going to charge or what? But they, did, they didn't shoot us, of course. But uh, the next thing they did was uh, load us all up and... Uh, take us down to the, the Davao to the port and, and take us out on a barge and up the side of a ship and then down into the hole. And uh, so they're going to move us out and take us north toward uh, Manila and on to Japan, which they'd already done with a lot of other troops. And, uh, and this was August of 44. And we were, we were we pulled into, uh, went around the bottom of... Uh, Mindanao and over to the west coast at uh, Zamboango and there we sat for a few days, uh, two or three days and then they allowed us up on deck to uh, 
run us through. I guess we stunk so bad that they, they ran us through a, a hose of uh, seawater and washed us off and then back down the about 30 foot ladder down into the hold again. And we were right on the uh, hull plates of the ship. Uh, and uh, you get down there and then you start sweating again and the salt would start getting burning into your skin. And, <laughs> and, uh, and we, we were kept in the hold all the time. We weren't allowed on deck. Uh, and they kept the hatch covers pretty well secured so that you got didn't get much air and it was pretty pretty terrible in fact uh, I figured we were about 20 to 21 days on that and uh, I had just about reached the point where I was wishing that a plane had come along and bomb us and finish us off and uh, at that time my uh, a submarine the paddle came along and uh, and there was three ships in this little convoy and we didn't I didn't know that at the time because it's down in the hole but uh, they hit one that was a kind of a tanker and it beached and uh, then they hit us with two torpedoes and and uh, I was asleep at the time of land down you know we were head to foot that's the way we were so close together we were head to foot all down on the bottom of the ship and I thought some of the guys were having a fight or something everybody started moving and pushing and I was trying to wake up and the next thing I know I was flying through the air upside down in a, in a ball of flame and I hit the bulkhead my back hit the bulkhead and I, I went down and the next thing I looked and there was this ladder and the guys were on it like ants and I went over and got on it and started going up the ladder I got Oh, maybe halfway up, and there was a captain that I'd seen there before, and he was right next to me in his face. I looked over at him. I said, don't, you know, you're pushing me off. He was coming up underneath me, and, and I was trying to hold on. And I looked over, and his face was all full of black powder, and his eyes were just bulged out. He, it was like talking to a zombie. And uh, so finally he forced me off, and I, I don't know. I must have fallen, you know. And I don't know what happened. The next thing I knew, I was outside the ship swimming. And uh, there was a fellow from New Mexico, Mike Pullis, up ahead of me. He was swimming, and, and we, were, uh, we were on the uh, sea side of the ship on, and uh, up near the bow. And uh, we were about a mile, mile and a quarter offshore, I guess. <coughs> and we went around the... He said, I'm shot. He said, the guy's shooting. I looked around, there was jab up there was shooting at us. And they were, I guess they were throwing grenades into the hole and uh, slicing their heads off with those sabers and stuff when they came up and bayoneting them. And, and, uh, and uh, finally, we went around the bow of the ship and got over toward the land side. There was a lot of debris and stuff in the water and oil all over. And, and uh, there was a big hatch cover there, so we... Uh, went over and got up on it, and uh, this Mike had got shot right through the uh, uh, shin, and his bone was sticking out, and uh, he got up on the hatch cover there. And there must have been 15, 20 of us on that hatch cover, and I looked around, and here was a third ship coming, and it was uh, a uh, like a little destroyer gunboat, and they were all lined up on the on the uh, decks of it on the, around the sides and shooting everybody in the water as they come by. So I jumped off of the hatch cover and I grabbed a little bag and uh, <coughs> it was a or straw. It was buoyant and I held it up to my head and uh, I looked around and the guy was pointing down like that and uh, they were shooting and anyway I didn't get hit and uh, they went on, and uh, and I found some debris there in the water. I found a, a little a long piece of board, and I sat on it, and that kept, kind of buoyed me up. And then I got a hold of another hunk of ladder about, oh, that long, and about that wide. And I put that little preserver up in there, and then I used it like a paddle and sat on this other thing. <coughs> a squall came up, started raining, 
and then uh, it started getting dark fairly fast. I remember one group come by and I tried to get on with them and they were all paddling. They had a little deal all put together and, and they were going and, uh, but they wouldn't pay any attention. You know, they were <laughs> everybody for themselves. And uh, then I looked around and uh, the, where the, the water was fairly warm and uh, cold rain hitting it and uh, it kind of some a mist kind of come up, you know, and uh, I threw the mist and everything over here and the, the moon was starting to come out. And, uh, I could see the Japs with their uh, uh, little uh, lifeboats picking their own up and they had long poles and they were pushing the debris aside and they'd get to an American, they'd kill him off, you know. <coughs> so luckily I was able to avoid them and I, I was going to go into shore, straight ahead into shore, but I, I could see tracer bullets flying up and down the beach. And I figured, well, I don't want to go in there because uh, they'll probably nail me. And <coughs> so I kept going up uh, to the, my, my left or to the north along the shoreline. And I was all night going along like that. And then the next morning I ended up and uh, <coughs> I was quite a ways north of this thing and I could, that one ship was still way back off to my right. I met up with a, a fellow there that was, uh, had worked, I, I recognized him, he'd worked in the kitchen and uh, he, uh, he was on a, about the size of this table. There was a, a life, uh, a bo uh, what do you call it, a life preserver. And it, uh, all around the edge, it was hollow in the center, and around the edge it was a, a circular uh, flotation type stuff. And uh, he was on that and just barely able to hang on. And I got over with him and I kind of abandoned my little things I'd been using to get along with. And uh, I got in that big preserver with him and he was so bad that he could hardly hold on. So I got him propped up in a corner and hung over the corner of that. And then uh, here come that ship again. It was come down and we were in the mouth of this bay. They call it Sindangan Bay. and. Uh, so I got him down off of there and into the corner and we got down over in the corner so they couldn't, you know, wouldn't notice us so bad. And they came in and they swung into the uh, bay and went down in there and then he, you could hear the machine guns. They were firing again. They were getting guys that were in that area, I guess, and then back out. Or I don't know, they might have been shooting at the natives. <laughs> and then they came back out so then we got over in the other corner of this thing. So they came right around us and never never saw us. And then uh, they pulled back out to sea. And, and uh, so I, I, I was trying to figure out what to do with this fella, you know. And, and I got out and, and there's a, a rope on that one end of that thing. So I got out the end of that rope and, and tried pulling and swimming. And I was so weak by that time, you know, that... Uh, I really couldn't do it. I, uh, it was heavy, and the, and the, the waves were pounding, and the, and it was getting windy, and the, the tides, and, and so I just finally I figured, well, the only thing I can do is, is head for shore, and, uh, and maybe I get somebody to come back and save him, and uh, so I started swimming, and uh, I uh, swam for a while, and then I'd stop and scoop the oil aside and get some up in my face, uh, clear water, and then I'd look and look for the green, and then I'd swim for the green. And uh, the next thing I know, I'd be gaining, I'd be getting closer to the green, and then all of a sudden, I'd, the winds and the tides would take me the opposite direction. So <laughs> and eventually, I just, uh, I just ended up, I was going, uh, kept going, and uh, I must have just finally passed out, you know. And uh, the next thing I know, I was in a, a little native banca or uh, outrigger canoe, and I just had my head down between my legs, and I could—I was so weak I couldn't raise them, but I could raise enough just to see a pair of brown legs. And I figured, well, a Filipino would pick me up, and <coughs> so I told him, I said, "Well, don't uh, kill me, don't turn me back in," uh, you know, and. Uh, and then I, the next thing I know, I was in a, a little shack, a uh, native shack, and I was trying to swim out the window, and there, some guys had a hold of me, and they gave me a shot. And uh, 
Then the next thing I woke up at a little schoolhouse up on the second floor and uh, the whole back of my head was all caved in. <laughs> and uh, I thought, well, I was lucky to be alive, which I was, and I was all torn up, you know, skin from head to foot. And uh, so then the Japs sent in the uh, planes, they started bombing, dive bombing around there. So then they, the natives uh, got us and uh, took us up in the hills and I, I was so weak they put me on a, a little, uh, like the Indians do with a horse and, and a couple sticks and a blanket, you know, they had me behind a, a carabao and uh, myself and another guy. And so we went up <coughs> across some uh, rice paddies and up toward the hills and then we ended up uh, in a Filipino uh, home way up in the hills and uh, Planes had come by once in a while, but they didn't know we were there, and uh, we kept under cover, and they fed us well. And and then a, a colonel who had been with us at Davao had been shipped out of there on a on a ship ahead of us, and uh, they'd allowed them on deck. And he had jumped off, and he knew the area around there. He'd been serv in service around there before the war. And uh, he knew the tides and everything, and he knew when to bail out. So he, he jumped overboard and uh, got to shore and made his way up into the hills, and he got with a bunch of natives. And uh, lo and behold, he was uh, kind of in charge of a bunch of gorillas. And uh, when we went down, why well, he came about... 30 miles up over the hills and stuff with a bunch of uh, equipment for us, uh, clothing and medical supplies. He brought a couple doc, uh, Filipino doctors and uh, food and uh, uh, ammunition and guns and stuff. And uh, So it was real lucky that way. And uh, after we were there about a month, why the... Uh, he said, well, we're going to go down to the shoreline some. So up over the hills we went and, and uh, ended up at a, uh, on a beach. And uh, that night they, they lit a fire on the beach and uh, all of a sudden a submarine rose up and out there in the, in the, in the bay. And uh, they got us all in these uh, outriggers, took us out, put us on the on the submarine, there was uh, out of the the uh, 82 of us that were still alive, uh, uh, two guys stayed to take care of some of the radio equipment that they had for the guerrillas, and uh, they were in touch with MacArthur's forces. And uh, so then they put us on the submarine, and we spent about five days on it coming up. We came out to Bayak, New Guinea, and they put us on some PT boats and took us down to another island, and, and then they put us on some uh, C-47 planes and hopscotched us out through uh, the whole area and finally down to uh, Brisbane, Australia, where they put us in a hospital and about a month later released us and uh, we came home on a ship. Well, it, like I say, it uh, was a worth a million dollars, but I wouldn't take a million dollars to do it again. Uh, and if I, uh, I would, uh, I'd never become a prisoner again. Uh, I'd go to, I'd, uh, I'd be willing to fight for this country again, but I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't become a prisoner. It had a, a profound effect on my health. And uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of things that, uh, problems that I had uh, were due to that. And I didn't realize, uh, I just went on with life, uh, went to work, and I went to school, uh, went to college, and I, uh, I tried, you know, real hard and, and uh, went to work, and I, uh, I feel I would have done much better if I hadn't had, you know, all that uh, rough treatment. Uh, so uh, it wasn't until about the time of the Vietnam War when they, they uh, started examining those fellows that come back and then they started 
figuring out that, you know, and, and a lot of that then came to the fore and, and, and some of our group, uh, ex-prisoners of war that, that uh, from World War II, that I know, we started meeting all the time and talking. And that started bringing out a lot of this uh, uh, thing. And, and, and then we were uh, a lot better able to cope with it, a lot better able to talk about it. For years, we'd never say a word, couldn't uh, hack it, you know, it, it get upset. And, uh, uh, but now uh, uh, some of us can uh, speak without uh, getting too upset. Some, you know, you think, well, you, a lot of guys, well, I always felt, well, just forget it. And, and, uh, and, but uh, even, uh, even that, you, it, still, it still comes back and at times and uh, depends on the situation, you know. Well, I think what I learned and uh, what I think everyone else should learn is that uh, we, have, we have more freedoms in this country than anywhere in the world. And we should be very happy with, to have those freedoms and we should realize that they cost an awful price and they don't come free. And uh, there's a lot of men that have died to gain those freedoms and uh, we should appreciate that. And just, just uh, you know, a lot of people in this world don't even have decent water. Uh, they don't have a, a place to stay. They can't take a bath. They don't have electricity. They don't have heating. They don't, uh, it's just uh, profound when you really get down to it. And, and a, lot of, a lot of us just sit around and complain about what a hard time we're having. We're actually having the easiest time uh, of any group in the world. And if I might read that little poem that I wrote years ago, there are thousands of men who lie in the sands of distant, desolate, foreign lands. They died for us, for you and me, to help us keep this great land free. A salute to them and a prayer to God to help us act deservingly. There, there's many men who have died down through history, you know, through all the wars, Civil War, the, uh, World War I, World War II, Vietnam, the Korean War, now the Korean War, there were many, many men died in that, that uh, uh, the ratio, let's see, uh, there was about, uh, I think about 33% of the, uh, of the prisoners that were, American prisoners that were taken in the uh, Pacific during World War II uh, I think about 33% of them returned. Or di let's see, 33% died. And uh, in, uh, via in uh, Korea, I think that number went up to about 37, 38%. And uh, there was about a, in Europe, there were about 100,000, a little over 100, 101 or 102,000 prisoners and uh, of that, I think it was about uh, about uh, one or two percent died out of the hundred thousand. There was about a thousand. So they were they were uh, you know they were some of them were treated real bad too. But uh, for the majority, I mean the, the Germans uh, treated them uh, with a little more decency than the. See the Japanese never. Uh, signed the Geneva Convention for the lands of rule warfare, or rules of land warfare. And uh, now, uh, they, so they felt they could do whatever they wanted. And they had uh, very strict discipline with their own troops. And uh, if uh, one of their soldiers uh, didn't do just what uh, uh, their superior wanted them to, he'd club them down and, and knock them down and they, he wouldn't, stay down, he'd jump right back up tension, he'd knock him down again. And uh, of course, we believe a little differently than that. And now, today, here the Japanese are asking, uh, they're acting as if uh, Harry Truman, when he uh, said, well, he's gonna drop the atom bomb on him, that uh, he was all wrong and that uh, we were the aggressor. Well, 
you know, there never would have been uh, that situation and uh, if they hadn't attacked at Pearl Harbor. And in addition to that, uh, uh, if Harry Truman hadn't uh, called for that to happen, why, there would have been a, a good one million American lives lost and that many at least or a lot more Japanese lives lost. That's a very important factor. Uh, without, uh, without faith, uh, it'd be, I think, almost impossible to survive. Uh, you, had to, you had to believe, otherwise, uh, you know, you, you always felt, well, God's going to help me. And uh, he did help me. And uh, any of those that returned, he sure helped. And uh, uh, yeah, there's there's no doubt at all. I, you know, you can say what you want. Uh, you can say, well, I had a lot of luck, or I I uh, had the will to survive, which is true. But uh, also, uh, probably the most important thing is uh, having a lot of faith.